Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. All three of us are professional illustrators. We've all published uh, books with all the major publishers. Together, we've published somewhere around 75 children's books, and we've all taught illustration at university art schools. That's right. Each week we come at you guys with fantastic illustrator interviews and also listener questions. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you learn something brand spanking new. And I want to start us off with a little bit of follow-up on our uh, episode that dropped uh, previously. I believe it is episode 162. This is episode 166. Uh, Do you remember the question, do pros practice or should you practice as a professional? And, uh, I have the benefit uh, here where I get, I read all the comments. So, uh, so I know what people are saying and, uh, I could come in and just read the ones that are positive towards me and not bring up. You don't don't see too many. (laughs) So here's, here's the, the follow up on that. I, uh, this is. This is on the YouTube. It says, I find it weird that Lee and Will saying you should draw a full illustration instead of practicing. The point of practicing is to get good fast at what you are bad at by not wasting time on other things you're already good at. If Jake had to draw a whole page just to practice drawing hands, he he would waste a lot of time drawing everything else on the page. By the time he finishes one page, he probably has drawn five hands in the time he could have drawn 50 if he has done only that and nothing else. Deliberate practice brings you better results faster. It's simple as that. The amount of improvement I had in two years studying drawing for real in comparison to the 10 years of doing it for fun is just ridiculous. So the point is, and and, and I, I got another like DM, someone DM me and they're like, I can't believe Will and Lee don't practice. <laughs> Dude, let me, let me, let me clarify here. Um, because they have totally misinterpreted what yeah. I'm going to speak for Will, but yeah, they've they, totally they got misinterpreted. It totally wrong. All right. Totally wrong. <laughs> for one, Jake, Jake is wrong. Let's just start there. <laughs> <laughs> There's no point there. I'm just going to say Jake's wrong. That's the statement. And now I'm going to move on. Um, okay. <laughs> the, my take on, on practice, they're absolutely right. Uh, deliberate practice is the way to get better. I'm a huge, huge fan of deliberate practice. And I use that specific technique in everything I do from sports to, uh, uh, calisthenics training to illustration. My point was don't just practice randomly like, Oh, like today's the day I do hands and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. My point was you're doing an illustration and you realize, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, I'm terrible at perspective. Well, now you have the subject matter that you need to get better at. You go over, do some practice illustrations, however much you need to do to make the illustration that you're doing. Mm-hmm. So the illustration is the guide on what you practice mm-hmm. versus some people just stay in student mode and they're like, okay, now I'm going to take a class on color. Now it's just random. Mm-hmm. And so I agree with the deliberate practice, but the illustration is what's telling you what to deliberately practice. Mm-hmm. Let me throw this out there. If I were if I were trying to do figure drawing right now, like I haven't mm-hmm. done figure drawing in decades, <laughs> thirty years. Yeah, actually, is le- actually <laughs> less. Hundred years. I did, I did I did some at UVU when I was teaching there mm-hmm. for fun. I I, st- I went into some friends' classes and and drew. But if I were to try to do it today, I would be horrible. And I would need to practice that specific thing to do that specific thing. My time in the way that I've divided up my time right now in my life is here with, with you guys, with SVS, with our duties here, but mostly with my, um, my current book project and marketing. So, and I don't have enough time to get my to-do list done. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my, my goal is to, um, do as much as I can, as best I can to make as much money as I can. And I divide my time up that way. It doesn't leave any time for practicing. Now, someone might say, well, wouldn't you make more money if you carved out some time for practicing illustration? I don't feel like I am suffering in getting the, my, my illustrations to communicate what I'm trying to communicate um, in my books, like I, like I, and so when I start to draw, 
my practice is like when I start on a new book, I start practicing on that new book, right? Like I, Mm -hmm. like I start the first drawings and they suck because I have been drawing for a while. And so I, in my process on the iPad, I draw, draw, throw it away, draw a little bit more, throw that away, draw some doodles, try to figure out a uh, pose. There's a lot of practice in figuring out the illustrations exactly. that I'm working on. Um, it, I don't just put pen to paper and keep everything that I draw. A, mm-hmm. a lot of what I'm drawing, I'm, I'm throwing away because it's, you could call it practice. So I could say I practice. But to me, I'm just, that's just my workflow. That's how I'm working mm-hmm. on the next book. But mm-hmm. I, I, I agree with that person is like, you know, that's a really good thing. And like a lot of students will always work on the thing they're good at and, and like hide hands, you know, put, put mm-hmm. pose a character with the hands behind the back or something like mm-hmm. that, you know? So, you know, if you're, you should know, you need to have an honest conversation with yourself. If you're avoiding the thing that you're not good at, yes, that's the thing you should be practicing. Um, I don't feel like I have that problem in trying to communicate with my illustrations and that's a, I'm trying to, I, I'm not perfect. I could get better at my style, but I'm also kind of going by the finish, not perfect mantra because I got to ship, mm-hmm. right? I have to ship. At the end of the day, I have mm-hmm. deadlines and I got to make those deadlines and I, I carve out my time to, so that I can ship. So, mm-hmm. I think that's, that's I think that's fair. A good good <laughs> response there. Um, okay. I wanted to ask you guys this another another topic thing. So, Apple announced their headset, their VR AR headset. Thirty five hundred dollars for this thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys dug in at all and, and saw what it actually does and what what it's capable of. But mm-hmm. is that a viable? tool to add to your uh uh you know your, your shelf of tools that you use as an artist not yet not yet i mean I, th- okay. I think we'll see we'll see what the practical uses are i don't i mean it kind of bums me out because i don't want to wear ski goggles all day <laughs> I, I, I i dread a world where everybody right. in an office is wearing ski goggles at the <laughs> same time i just don't like it um I don't know if that's me becoming an old person and saying, mm-hmm. and just basically drawing the line in the sand saying I'm done with technology at, the, right. at this point in time. But uh, it kind of bums me out in a weird way. I don't know why. I'm going to have to plead ignorance. I don't really know how it could help. Like, educate me. Okay. So, um, say you, you're, you have the choice to update your computer setup and mm-hmm. you could spend... $500 on a monitor, uh, get a new laptop, a new iPad, whatever, you know, iPad, laptop, monitor, mm-hmm. all those kinds of things in a, in a workstation. Or you could purchase this headset mm-hmm. and have, you wouldn't need a TV, you wouldn't need any sort of screen mm-hmm. other than what could be projected in front of your eyes, right? Mm-hmm. It could be as small or as big as you wanted to. Now, mm-hmm. The reason they announced this thing now and it doesn't come out until next year is so that people can so essentially so the app developers could kind of work on what this thing's going to actually be able to do other than what Apple's decided. I don't know if you remember when the iPhone first came out, but it just had Apple's apps on it. And then they said they, they opened the app store and anybody could make apps for the phone once they knew what it was capable of doing and whatnot. And that's when you really started to see like all these cool productivity things. You could use Dropbox on your phone. You could, mm-hmm. um, you know, you could use the phone to like scan um, uh, leaves to find out what kind of plants are, you know, everything in between that, right? Right. So I, I imagine artist application would be... Um, if you did have an an iPad or something like that, you could probably have the canvas be as large as you wanted it to be and paint on it like it was an actual like the canvas. Or you could say, "Here's my blank canvas that I want to put a drawing on, whether it's a sheet of paper or a six by six foot square canvas. You know, something like James Jean is working on, and it could project the image that you've already scanned on there. So you could just essentially." use it like a projector, but without the projector shadow working in a way. So you could like draw on it that way. 
um, you could have a virtual reality like um, studio of uh, of life drawing. So all different poses. You could be in there. You could do life drawing with this thing on, so you don't have to look at photos, but you could look at something three dimensional. Or you could, mm-hmm. you know, say load up a horse or load up an elephant. And you could draw an elephant from any position too that mm-hmm. you wanted. Well, now now um, I want one. Oh, yeah. Tell me all this stuff. Are, so are we thinking, supposed to be looking at screens two inches from our eyes? That's the, my concern. As I know that's humans, the other thing. It seems it, weird. In the video, they showed that, um, you know, your iPhone. Can you look at an iPhone pixels and, and see the pixels on the phone? Or is it too small? Too small. Yeah. Well, this thing, what they've done is they've shrunk those pixels by. I don't know, 300% or something. They said they could fit 64 little like diodes in the same space that they fit a pixel now for an iPhone. Holy crap. Well, it's right. not the clarity. I'm, I'm just wondering just the proximity. Like as humans, we're not made to look at something that close for that long. I don't I don't know what what that exactly comes from, whether it's like it crosses your eyes or whatnot, but they... I'm I'm sure that's what's going to happen. We're going to be a society when you take off the goggles, your, yeah, your eyes are going like, to be all loopy. No, you'll never take them off. <laughs> Why well, would you ever take them off? Now we're entering um, Ready Player One, right? right. World, right. you know what I mean? If, right. if, if you remember that, it's so. Let me say I, something. The Oasis. And I know this is. I'm going to take it in a direction that you didn't plan on, mm-hmm. and probably a completely different direction. But like, Uh-oh. I don't know. I was just thinking of like. We, you know, we come, we get letters and we get comments and all that sort of stuff about AI. And I was thinking about this the other day, since we're talking tech, that if you just think about this, if you could, um, this, cause I believe this is coming pretty quick. If you could scan your characters, you know, like I've got this Paul character for pickleball, Paul, right. Mm-hmm. And all the other characters in the book. Nice so if I scan enough of them different views and stuff the ai is going to be able to redraw them in any pose that i describe in my style mm-hmm. right so the, one of the big arguments is you're ripping other people off but i don't think if for most people listening if you could press a button basically and have your drawing done in your style in the pose mm-hmm. that you want and you're not ripping anyone else off are you really going to say, no, I'd rather spend the time drawing it myself? Now, draw, don't get me wrong. I love to draw and it's, there's satisfaction in that. But if you, if it's, you know, if, if you could put out, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're measuring how much money you make a year by how much work you do and you're like, I could double my income or triple my income by speeding this process up. I don't mm-hmm. think many people are going to say no to that. And so that's something to think about when you're talking about technology, right? Like, I don't know. But, the, but yeah, the, I agree. But, I mean, it comes down to whether do you value how something was made over what you made? And there'll yeah. be a certain amount of people that say yes. That's that it's important on how you make it. But I think there's an equal number of people that'll say, I just want to make the things that I want to make and I'll do it the easiest way I possibly can and still get the result that I want to. You know what I would love to do is go back and interview the guys that made wagon wheels or buggy whips, you know, who were, I mean, they were sure they were positive that the automobile was a fad, that it was a dumb thing, that it wasn't going to take over that it was, I mean, like they were convinced And at some point they had to give up at some point they had to just admit. It is interesting to think about those, those industries that totally died, you know, where the thinking about back then, this is sort of a morbid thought, but this is sort of where I go sometimes, (laughs) you know, you know, in Western towns, there's a couple of things that are just a disaster on society. There's the, there's the guillotine, there's the hangman's, little setup and then there's that stockade that's in the middle of the town mm-hmm. where you like right. get locked in and everybody walks by and laughs at you right you and throws a tomato in your that, face yeah <laughs> <laughs> you think there was a company that made those things <laughs> <laughs> i 
Um, <laughs> I think everything was made locally Stockade back then. Yeah, they were made. Okay. You know, you didn't order one off of the Wells Fargo wagon. Oh yeah, like <laughs> Sears Roebuck catalog. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you bring up a good question though, Will. Like, if if uh, I mean, I actually thought about how handy it would be to have all my characters modeled in 3D, and mm-hmm. I could pose them and then draw over them just to like uh, speed up the the process of doing mm-hmm. like a, a comics project. And essentially, AI could you know, could do that now if you know how to do it. And probably in the future, we'll, there'll be an app that can easily set that up for mm-hmm. you. Um, and I, I, I think ultimately what these tools will do will make it so that anybody can tell the story that they want to do. And any uh, computer could generate a story handcrafted f- for your tastes right? The only problem though, is that it's all based on stuff that's previously been created and, Mm -hmm. and it lacks, I, I think it'll lack that X factor that, oh, wow, I did not see that coming. I, you know, you look at like the thousand movies that come out every year or 10,000 movies that come out every year and the TV shows or whatnot. And all of it is kind of like, uh, I, I would say like 90, 95% of it is just derivative. Like, mm-hmm. oh, you like this? Well, here's a version of that, but it's mm-hmm. a little bit shifted. Oh, you like a Western? Here's a space Western. Mm-hmm. Oh, you like space Western? Here's a fantasy Western or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, they're all just little variations of that. And every once in a while, you get something that is so unique, it's so special, uh, because it's based on somebody's, like this, this, weird alchemy of someone's personal experiences combined with other people's experiences put together to make something truly genius and new Mm -hmm. and fresh. I don't know if AI is capable of, of surprising us like that. If I don't know if it, if it can only do derivative stuff. So I think, I, I think that's one side of it. The other thing is, is I find myself being more and more interested in very tactile, like original created artwork, like seeing a person cutting a wood block and laying the paper on it and rubbing in the ink and pulling it back and seeing the finished product. And that's lately has been so much more appealing to me than just seeing digital art. Well, that, I think that's, where I th- that's why I think the original is going to make a huge push in the next 10 years. If you can do original mm-hmm. art, mm-hmm. there will be a market for it because it's a product that people can't make anymore. The, yeah. the right. Right. Skills going away. Right. So, anyways, going back to the headset, though, I a lot of people are like, thirty five hundred is way too much money. I agree. It's the early adopters are going to pay for it. The people with a budget, they or, you know that that have that are going to buy it. They're going to figure out whether it's a valuable tool or not, and then, and then we'll find out. You know, in in two or three years, whether or not it's something that the mass general public will really adopt. Well, what's, what's the but, difference between this and the Google Glasses? I mean, didn't Google Glasses try to do this three years ago? I, I should point you towards uh, Marquez Brownlee's review of it. He got to wear it. He's a tech reviewer. He's like maybe the most popular tech reviewer on, on YouTube, 17 million subscribers. Go look him up. He does great tech review videos. Mm-hmm. He's so straightforward. He just gets right to it, which I love. He doesn't waste your time, which I love. Um, but he said, he said, there's some things that this thing does that he's like, are honestly like magic. And I, he's like, I, I've tried on every headset. I've done everything. And there's things that this headset does, technology. And he, he's like, I don't want to say it's magic because technology isn't magic. But he said, there's some things where I'm just like, I can't explain how they would be able to do that. And he said, I will look around at the tiniest little dot in my field of view and it will highlight that and know that that's what I'm looking at. Oh, man. And he says, all you have to do is pinch your fingers together and it'll it'll select it. So if you see, you know, if you see the letter L on a text in this headset and you're looking at a letter L and you pinch it like that, it'll highlight that letter L, you know? So he's just like... The, the, the way they've amped up all the sensors and technology wow. the thing has like 14 cameras on it, both 
that that record the environment around you in 3D, but also are recording like your face so it can project your face, your eyes out so that, that people see what your eyes That's are weird. doing. <laughs> it is a little, a little goofy. So am I saying I'm going to get one? No, but I, I, I can't say I won't get one. Do you want <laughs> you know? one? I like, think it'd like be cool. If it was free. If it, yeah, if it's free, I'd definitely try it out and I'd want to get some sort of 3D modeling software to use in it, some sort of sketching software to, to use with it, just to just see what it's what's capable of. But I think for now it's more of a toy than an actual productivity tool. But I think it could be a productivity tool. I also could see you know how like how many of you have just gone out and bought your phone straight up, paid cash for your phone? Mm-hmm. Or have you done like the, the the plan where you go into an AT&T store or Sprint or whatever and they're like, yeah, here's your phone. You just pay $50 today and here's your monthly bill. And essentially you pay for that phone over time, right? I could see this being one of those things where, yeah, it's, you know, uh, the consumer, like the non-pro version, just the, the regular people's version is a $1,500 device and you go into an AT&T store or something like that or an Apple store and they're like, okay, yeah, you can walk out with this today for 50 bucks and we'll just put you on this plan. And, uh, and you wouldn't even feel the pain of shelling out that much for it. I could mm. see that that's the only way I could see this thing being fully adopted by every, you know, by the, the, the mass audience of, of mm-hmm. people out there. So Something to think about. Use illustrators. If anybody out here is listening and gets one of these next year, I would really love to know your feedback on it. But that's that's down the road. Um, should we do questions? Yeah. Let's do some questions. Okay. This comes in from Anonymous. They say, a day has only so much hours. Firstly, thank you for so much for all the information you three give in your podcast. Um Let's see. I'm also most grateful for the honesty you have with some subjects because I have the impression that sometimes online discussions about illustration and especially a career in it are a bit too much sugar-coated. It's also good sometimes to hear the less appealing stuff just to be prepared so your honesty is refreshing. So we appreciate that. And we don't try. I don't think we sugarcoat things too much. We're. I think we're pretty honest about a lot of stuff that, that happens in, on an uh, illustration career. Okay, so... She says, I have not the simplest style, so it can take me a bit of time to finish a piece. And so I know, um, and so I know and plan for it. My problem is that sometimes unexpected stuff happens. For example, briefs coming in late, unending retakes requests, sickness from the clients and me and stuff like that. And then all my planning is destroyed and there isn't enough time anymore because I'm still in an early stage in my career. The jobs are not yet good enough to the, the pay isn't good enough. I work sometimes simultane- simultaneously on different projects. The, pro- the problem is then when one is delayed, it impacts the time allowed for the next one. And soon I have to face several deadlines at the same time. I work really late then. Do you have any advice for a situation like that? Because days only have so many hours, catching up can be a real struggle. So essentially, uh, you know, ideally, this person would be able to take on three projects that pay what the 10 projects they're doing right now pay, right? Mm -hmm. So now they're, they're overloaded with projects. Things get messed up. You get sick. A kid, you know, needs to be picked up from school because they're sick. It's a day record. You no longer have the afternoon to work on something. How do you guys deal with, uh, schedules and hours in the day? The limited hours in the day. I'm going to let Lee go first this time. <laughs> Lee's not ready, I can tell. No, no, I am. I'm just trying to I'm trying to figure out which which part of the question to answer. Is it is is the problem that they're slow or the problem that they're not organized? Those are two different problems. So yeah. So I think let's just chip away at it. Number one, I would say do whatever you can do to make your workflow more efficient. So um, that might be changing your medium from oil paints to digital, <laughs> you know, something right, like okay, that. Right, because if, if your process is slow, even a good product, 
you know, if you have a productivity routine and you got your days organized, if just the way you make illustrations is too slow, it's still not going to help that much. Yeah. So it's kind of a two parter question. Mm -hmm. Like, are you productive when you're making work and can you speed that up? Right. But if the problem is you're unorganized and you're not painting enough and that's why you're slow, that's easy to solve. How I solve that now is, um, I like to use time blocking. I um, always have. I've been a big advocate of that for a long time, but I've slowly refined that technique to be simpler and more effective. And I love it when you can figure out how to make those two things happen, something be simple and more effective. Um, for me, I sat down and, and said, okay, in a day, how much, how do I want to divide a day? Not talking about specifically what I'm working on, like, oh, I'm doing page 16 in a book. That's like too specific, but for four hours a day, I'm working on a book project. That's kind of how I have my life organized. And, you know, I can change what that is in that four hours, but so four hours a day is book work. And then two hours a day might be uh, gallery work and then one hour a day admin. So that's how I break my day down. And then I fit in what the important things are in those categories. But I know for four hours a day, I'm making books for two hours a day. I'm making gallery images and one hour a day. I'm doing admin. And that's how I schedule mm -hmm. exercise too. I know for I know for at least an hour and a half I'm exercising. So it's really easy to break your day down and then you figure out what's the most important project that goes in those categories. The problem that I see a lot of people do is they try to make a big to-do list, but it's too specific. And so it looks like they're just checking things off when really you got to think, how do I want to spend my day? And then mm -hmm. organize with that as your sort of top-down menu. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing too is, is when working with the client, um, if there's control that if you have some control in the scheduling, always double the time you think it's gonna, it's going to take, like, even if you pad it, like still just double it. Um, and then, and then like Lee said, time block so that, you know, okay, this project's due in two weeks. I'm going to turn in sketches as soon as possible so I can get feedback. And while I'm getting feedback, I can work on this other thing and overlapping the projects that way. Now, this person wanted to remain anonymous, uh, but they did send their portfolio for us to look at mm -hmm. privately. So you could see, I'll just describe their style. It does have a lot of detail, but I wouldn't ch change the style at all. Like, it is a really unique and compelling style. I think if this style takes a long time, I, I think you can probably charge more for the jobs that you're getting or say no to, to lowball offers um, and court uh, clients that are going to um, pay you better, pay you what you're worth. Um, that's that's another another strategy there is is you know, start looking for whether it's through an agent or through your own efforts, work that's going to pay you more. And the other thing too, guys, uh, this is just a general rule to every illustrator. You got to figure out a way to get some passive income going in your illustration career. You, that just relieves so much pressure mm -hmm. when you can have some sort of online shop, whether you're selling brushes or you're selling tutorials or you're selling uh, digital downloads uh, of, of books that you've made or artwork collections that you've done um, and that you're just constantly releasing something new uh, multiple times in the year uh, just, just to, uh, just to like offset the pressure that these freelance jobs, uh, uh, you know, which may or may not come and may or may not pay on time can happen in your, in your life. So that's, that's another thing too, to, to really think about. This is a great style. Yeah. And really, really accomplished. Can you send a link? Which, which email or which question is that? I can't, I don't see the link. No, no. Um, the link was in the email, it. but I texted it to you. Oh, oh, oh okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Let me point yeah, so out one this person's more already working digitally. So that, that would be my comment was, was one way to speed up. But yeah, like I think that the, the passive income thing, and that's not something you can just do overnight, but that should be a goal to get mm -hmm. to. Um, and the other, the other thing is, um, you know, I mean, there's really in, in children's book illustration, there are, there really are haves and have nots and, Unfortunately, a lot of the haves have won awards. So sometimes, you know, your only 
an award away from your income going up, your 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 profile going up. But I think in today's world, um, your best bet to be able to um, increase your your income is to own some IP that's also making money. You know, to, to just the the days of I think the days of being a strictly freelance illustrator, mm-hmm. not writing just illustrating are really tough unless you're unless you have the rare skills i always point to like jim madsen or Teresa larson um Mm -hmm. therese uh yeah they're just they're fast Mm -hmm. they can they're without looking at their work i mean it's hard to describe but i mean like the skill level is off the charts. They're wanted by everyone, mm-hmm. um, and so, so the so when your demand goes up, you can charge more, right? Mm-hmm. Like if five people want you for the same day, then your price just goes up, and one yeah. of those five mm-hmm. clients are going to pay more. So you know this person's work is in the I would put it in the very competent area, uh-huh. but. It could, it could be and I, with this style. I don't think you can make that style really any better. Uh-huh. You I do. know, like, what's that? I do because, do, well, uh, well uh, just looking at what the problem is. If there was, if there was no problem that we were addressing, and I was just looking at this website, I'd say the work looks fine. But um, if they're struggling with time and speed. You know, it's it's one thing to have a really busy illustration like your poster is a great example of that. It's or not your yeah yeah your it's your coloring book poster and the, and the the pickleball Paul poster. It's got a ton of stuff in there. Right. It's awesome, and it was intentionally that way, almost like a Where's Waldo kind of image. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but the rest of your images are not like that in the book. Like if you did that on every page, I'd be like, well, would, dude, yeah. we got to have a talk. <laughs> I can <laughs> and, share that while we're talking. Yeah, go ahead. And so I'm looking at her work and I'm thinking, well, every single il- illustration is sort of jammed up with detail. And this person ca- has, all they have to do is dial back the switch on their backgrounds in terms of rendering the backgrounds and A, the characters and the actual content like Will's doing here. Um, you know, she, if she vignettes a little bit more, half the work goes away. And mm-hmm. so she speeds up by by twice as fast, doubles her speed if she starts to be simple. Now, I'm not saying don't make any illustrations that are complicated, like I'm talking about Will's pickleball poster. It's awesome, and it's specifically supposed to be like that for that image. But like I said, if Will was doing that every time, I'd have to have a talk with Will saying, hey, dude, you need to simplify. And that's what (laughs) I think this person could do. Um, Every illustration doesn't need to be jammed. It's almost like she's trying to fit as much stuff in the background as she can. And Will's showing on screen right now, if you guys are watching on YouTube, you don't need that. You can imply things being back there in a busy Mm -hmm. world without drawing every single little thing and rendering it with a shadow and form and all that stuff. I mean, you could even just silhouette a bunch of stuff back there and you cut out your time in half and you made a better illustration because now I'm not looking at the background. I'm looking at what the focal point is. So this person Mm -hmm. needs to really pick the focal point and then dial back on the rest of the stuff. She'll make twice as many illustrations just with that one change and make the illustrations better too. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I uh, that's I mean that's just to clarify or organize all these thoughts. I, I'd say number one, uh, adjust your style or your workflow so that you can create work faster. Okay, number two, um, start trying to get uh, uh, clients that pay better. Number three, time block. So make sure that you're really good at. I know and it sounds like you're already good at organizing time, but I think relieving yourself of doing so much first can help you manage your time better. And then third, start looking at ways you can can get some passive income going as well. And it doesn't have to be art related passive income either. It could be, um, you know, any sort of outside investment. You know, something something that can whether it's you're going to go uh, get a bigger house and rent out rooms. I've heard of people doing that where it's like, I, I could rent the years. studio apartment 
or I could, you know, scrounge up some money, put a down payment on a house, rent out for the rooms and still live in a studio apartment space. But, you know, be, don't, be, don't think these things are easy, but they do pay off. I've, I've done that at every house I've lived in, except for this current one. Mm -hmm. And how I started that was just when I would go on vacation, we would Airbnb our house and it was a ton of work to try to get it to that point. But mm -hmm. by the end it was a, you know, well-oiled clock. And if I was going on vacation, it would pay more than the vacation cost. So I would make money going on vacation. Right. Yeah. And so, and so, so I mean, Jake's exactly right. He's like, you look around your life and you start to think, you just have to think creatively about all of it, especially if you want to be an illustrator. You know, I, it, and it doesn't mean these giant chunks of money. It's just all these little things you do. Like, for example, I started selling brushes uh, about, a what, three weeks ago or something mm -hmm. on my website. That's just seven. I think they're seven ninety nine or something like that for my watercolor set because I get a lot of emails about how do I do texture and Photoshop and all that stuff. And I was like, why am I not selling a brush set? And right. so I made the brush set. Now, am I going to get rich off that brush set? Absolutely not. But... Seven ninety nine, seven ninety nine, seven ninety nine. Yeah. So it's just all these things start rolling forward. Uh, you know, sell a print, sell a, a brush pack. You know, whatever you're going to do, and um, and then it starts to accumulate, and then you get some illustration jobs, and that's the that's sort of the life of the illustrator, in my opinion. Now, I don't see people just like getting, oh, just you're getting paid to do a book, and that's it. Um, right. It's all these it, other. It used avenues. to be that you could. Uh, you know, it, it, I think about the like the newspaper days. <clears throat> if your comic got syndicated across the United mm -hmm. States, now there's five thousand newspapers who are picking up your comic, and your most next of them are online. Yeah, now most of them are online. But you know, in the eighties, fifty forties through the through the eighties or the nineties, if you got syndicated, your biggest problem was next like where what country club were you going to be a part of mm -hmm. <laughs> you know uh and that just isn't the case anymore um so you do have to be you do have to take a little bit more control over over what you do some other uh, revenue streams that i have that are drips just small things but they do add up is uh youtube i have over 100 videos on YouTube, those are all making ad revenue and it comes out to 100 to $200 a month right now. And that's me not having posted a video on YouTube since January, right? Um, I have links to Amazon uh, purchases, affiliate links, mm -hmm. and I just post those everywhere. Anytime I send a link to something, you should buy this book, you should buy this pen, you should buy something. I'll just say, by the way, this is an Amazon link uh, or Amazon affiliate link. I, I get a kickback and that makes a couple hundred bucks a month too. You know, you do enough of those and pretty soon you're paying rent just on passive income. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question. All go right. buy my brushes, by the way. It's on my website, Lee White. Yeah, go get Lee's. <laughs> How much would you say you have had made from brushes in the last month? Um, it's, yeah, I just launched it like three weeks ago, I think, but probably around 500 bucks. There you go. There you go. Okay. So this you comes, just make some crappy brushes and sell them online. Is that what you do? These brushes are badass. <laughs> Can we say that? They are pretty good. There is brushes. no brush that makes these marks. Did you no brush. give us uh, samples that we could use? Did you give us uh, a free, a well, free once you, once you canceled your subscription on my Patreon, you're dead to me. <laughs> you're not kidding. <laughs> It was eight dollars a month. I get Less that for free. Than a frappuccino. He made Lisa buy him. <laughs> His own wife. I charged her double. <laughs> you you paid uh, Emerson's allowance with brushes. That's true. <laughs> All right. Here, this comes from this question comes from Rochelle. Uh, leveling up is my portfolio blast. So get ready to look at this portfolio. Will you want to, you want to share it, pull it sure. up and share it. Um, Am I still sharing my screen. No, you're not, but okay. you can do it. She says that she starts out saying she loves the dad jokes, but Jake needs to work on his rapping skills. Noted. I will I work on those that. rapping skills. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have, I came up with a new dad joke. Can, can I do Let's that now? Let's okay. Do it. What do you call it? when you're at the beach and you drop your waffle beach waffle. Okay. I, I don't know what San Diego. Oh, no. <laughs> Let go of my San Diego. 
All right. My kids love that one. Uh, okay. So she says, I have recently subscribed to SVS Learn and love the classes so far. From what I've gathered from all your wisdom, I can step back and see the port that my portfolio is a little lackluster and missing the it factor. But I need an honest answer as to why. Friends and family say it's good, but they're th thankfully kind and supportive no matter what. Um, the goal is to get into traditional children's book publishing. Three years ago, I started a portfolio for character design and animation, but shifted gears a few months ago. It's taken me a slow few years to get here since I have a newborn and toddler, plus a full-time career in health uh, care. So why is my portfolio so meh? Thank you for all that you do, Rochelle. So uh, if you're on the YouTube, you can look at it. And we're on it's like it's school got of visual all the, storytelling on YouTube. Yeah, school of visual storytelling. This it's got all the the pieces, but she's right. There's there's like this little bit of it. So let me just that's make a, let's make some comments on these and give her a little bit of a critique okay. here. Okay. So this one, this one, this illustration we're looking at now. If you're on the podcast, you can't see mm -hmm. it, but I'll describe it. It's um, really nice framing of trees. Our our view is looking. At, from a dark forest out into the light. Mm -hmm. And there's some really fun texture on the trees and really fun texture on the leaves. And it's very well done and good color. It's an analogous color scheme. And there's a, looks like a mom and a daughter and they're, they're in the clearing out in the, in the light area. And uh, they're, they're pointing at a house. It looks like. Yeah. And my thing on this is it's always going to be like, what story are you telling? Right. Mm -hmm. And to me, pointing isn't interesting. <laughs> um, we need to tell a story that is that that our viewer can relate to, mm -hmm. that they can feel something from. I don't feel anything from this. I need to be you need to make me angry. You need to make me happy. You need to make me laugh. You need to make me cry. You need to make something. me do something. And the house out there is so that the trees are so much more interesting than the house. But the house is supposed to be the point of interest. Right. So there needs to be something in that house that's more interesting than the foreground trees that are just framing. Great mm -hmm. texture on the trees, great texture in the leaves, but we're not telling a compelling story. So that's where it starts. And I, I made this mistake when I first started out is I wanted to make pretty pictures. I just wanted to make really, you know, and we're concerned as beginning illustrators of learning the medium, learning how to handle it. Learning right. how to draw trees, learning how to draw leaves, learning how to draw houses and people. And we often, as beginning illustrators, forget that that is the second important thing. We, mm -hmm. It's the first important thing to learn as an illustrator because if you can't draw anything, you can't illustrate anything, right? But the first thing should be, what am I trying to say? And why am I saying it? And I, I always use the example of, of you know, like, like, Reducing your illustrations down to, to speech, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. <laughs> what this illustration is saying is, hey, mom, house. Now, would you, right. would you, would you go up to someone and say, I got to tell you this one. This is what I heard the other day. Hey, mom, house. No. You, know, right. you, you just, right. it's, yeah, let, let me tell you a story. This mom and this daughter were walking and they pointed at a house. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just the most so, boring story ever. So, so just think of it like that when you're illustrating. And I pick on this one because it's it's one of the best ones in here for me. Mm -hmm. um, it looks it, nice, but you but there's nothing there's no con right. there's no reason to look at it. Right. Uh, can so you be, go, can you go back and and show kind of the overview of the portfolio yeah. because I agree with all that stuff. Each one of them is like, okay, there's a person like like Will said if I was describing this, hey you guys, check out this illustration. This lady is sitting in a chair. Yeah. Right. I mean, who cares? Like nobody cares. And it's it's a great thing what we'll say. And I don't want to sound too harsh on these, but man, you just say, What am I drawing? And why does someone care? Hey guys, I want to show you this awesome picture. There's a baby, he's on a blanket. Mm -hmm. Like that. Mm -hmm. And we're literally describing these illustrations. And if they sound boring, they are boring. Yeah. That's so, why. So you're doing the right thing um by learning how fine. to draw. And learning how mm -hmm. to render and learning how color and doing all that stuff. And it's a huge ask. Like, we're being really critical right now. But that, this is the only thing that's going to help you is for us to be really critical. We've all been here. 
So yeah. you could have said the same exact comments about my early portfolio. And, and I finally took some people who were brave enough to tell me what I really needed to hear for me to make those serious changes. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, it does sound harsh, but it, like you're, you're doing the right thing in learning how to draw, learning how to paint, learning how to color, but you gotta take it to the next step, which is to tell interesting stories. And the way yeah. to tell an interesting story is to have something happen, have something unexpected happen. This one's probably the only one where there's something unexpected, but it looks like this little dragon is part of the umbrella. I don't totally understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. So it's confusing. Um, but telling some kind of story, like Will was saying, like, you know, if that baby is sitting on the blanket and something might be happening to the baby, like, uh, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, like there's like, like the baby's reaching up and getting ready to knock something over. I'm thinking some of the images of like in no David. Well, now there's potential energy. Like we're worried for the baby or mm -hmm. something. Um, you know, put a spider Can in I there and all of a sudden the baby, now you have an uncomfortable situation <laughs> or, or I, I don't know. It just has to be something. It can't be like a little baby rattlesnake. That's cute. That's in little cute right rattlesnake. In her. You know, and, that, and it's about to grab it. You well, know, it's my, it, what, I, uh... Wilson, what we're talking about is my biggest critique on a lot of children's portfolio, children's illustration portfolios, picture book, people getting into picture books. It's my number one complaint where they overly, they over sentimental images that don't mm -hmm. tell any story and you see it just all the time. And so it's not just picking on this one person. It's kind of an overview of the, of a lot of portfolios we see. It's, it's a rabbit like eating a cookie. It's, they're not doing anything. There's no yeah. reason to stay there, even if it's well drawn and it, but it's just almost just overly sweet. Yeah. Like look at the cute rabbit and he's eating a, a sweet cookie. Like you come it, in the house, you come in the house after a long day, you see your family, your husband, wife, kids and say hey a rabbit ate a cookie right <laughs> can i offer a counterpoint yes. to this can i share the screen yes share and screen okay. well if you're going to disagree with us i don't know i don't i, yeah, I don't, just don't want to see don't if this if this advice applies everywhere so you guys know tatahiro usugi he really popular illustrator in the 2000s 2010s mm -hmm. uh so much so that i saw his stuff creeping up in like all the art of books for animation mm -hmm. yeah so this is like his sort of thing that he's doing um now let's apply your story method to this mm -hmm. there's a woman walking down the city street okay once there was a woman. Hey guys, did you hear? There's a woman. She's <laughs> okay, but she took okay, a walk. Let, let who's his client? Me, who's his client? Me, yeah, that's What's a big. It's a big difference. <laughs> and there's there. Well, I can sum this up. Is is you have to ask you when you back up. The underlying factor is not what story is an image telling, but why is this image interesting? That's a better way to go about yeah. this mm -hmm. because when you're talking about children's art for picture books, it's why is this interesting, and then subtitle what story is it telling but really you, you can back up and say why is something interesting and you can go a number of different places with that so one of them can be it's a really interesting story that's going to make it interesting the other thing can be an artistic technique or application and mm -hmm. so you know uh, to use an example like monet if i were to come up to you and say hey you guys haystacks <laughs> not going to be that lilies. interesting right well it's lilies. decorative but that but, art is to be used right. to decorate but and that's the, what the i see point, this... my point is like it was yeah. the interesting thing is the application of paint and it, with tata hero it's time of day graphic shadow patterns it's these are fashion compositions yeah composition yeah. um so but that's what i want to hang it on my it. wall but you know. also when he adds story to this style then you get a real banger. I'm going to pull mm -hmm. this one here. Well, then so you get you Coraline. Have, you go to Art of Coraline. It's all based right. on his work. So Here you have <clears throat> um, you have a woman picking out cheese, right? Uh, the, the composition and the way the, the, the texture and everything sort of leads you to this, it actually makes this boring thing of a woman picking out cheese to something really like almost like uh, uh, fashionable and exotic in a way like mm -hmm. oh I wish I was there picking out cheese because this is this is like a high-end cheese shop 
all the women are wearing like uh night like uh, uh high heels and like they're really fashionably dressed you could tell it's a, a cool part of paris or something like that mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's it's the overall vibe is is i think what is being captured here is just something cool but but i think composition goes a long way in a lot of this guy's drawings uh in his in his paintings well and value and pattern and everything value else and pattern, he's doing, i mean everything. he's doing all the art stuff so well that it's that that's what makes it interesting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah so that's a, that's a good that's a good way i just wanted to like push that um yeah, explanation good, good, a, a good little call. further uh okay so let's go into the next next question some people, here some people are so good with style and technique they could draw anything and it's interesting it's mm-hmm. it, yeah. it really does come down to that and so you just got to figure yeah. out what's interesting about your work now if you like jake said if you combine a really interesting style with a really interesting story you, you get sean tan right right so, and i think i think that's kind of your your the paths you have to you see so many artists follow one or one or the other path like Gary Larson or Matthew Inman not the greatest artists hilarious though like they can just draw something funny it could be a guy sitting on a couch and it'll right. get a chuckle out of you right um and then you have somebody like um Mike Mignola right like he does Hellboy and his illustrations are just so his style is so unique and the illustrations are so moody. He, all he has to do is draw, you know, somebody stepping out of the shadows and you're like, Oh man, I, you know, I want to, I could I almost like touch that thing. It has so much uh, volume to it. So mm-hmm. there you go. Okay. This comes from Lily SOS making it off the island is subject matter. Hey guys, thank you so much for creating such a funny and wise podcast. Oh, that should be like our tagline. Uh, three point perspective. And funny and wise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a full time children's book illustrator and I've been listening to you guys while I work for years. I can't believe that someone's been listening to us. We've been doing this enough that they could say they've been listening to us for years. Wow. <laughs> I guess to. Five years now. We should have celebrated our five-year anniversary. I think it was in March. Anyways. Okay. I'm getting hung up. I'm just going to read this. I'm not going to comment anymore. Okay. (laughs) I live in New Zealand, and I have managed to work for some amazing publishers locally, and have found an illustration agent based in New Zealand also. While I'm very grateful for the connections that I've made and the successes I've had so far, I'm always looking to grow. I really want to reach overseas markets, especially in the U.S., my agent had indicated that she's open to dual representation in different territories. However, I have not had any success yet in re- reaching out to publishers or agents outside of New Zealand and Australia. I'm wondering how location can affect career. I'd also love any advice you have for me to grow my illustration career outside of the country I live in. Thanks, Lily. Are we allowed to share? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Good so, stuff. Okay. Again, we're really on, good stuff. We're on uh, School of Visual Storytelling, and the you know, my quick hit is mm-hmm. that the work is good, mm-hmm. um, but not I, good enough for the U.S. Well, no, <laughs> not no. I wouldn't say that, but I mean, like, what she's saying is, you know, she has she's hasn't found a, a um uh, an, an agent or a rep to rep her here. I would say this, like, so if I was an agent, right. And I had a stable of artists Mm -hmm. in order for me to take on someone new, Mm -hmm. they would have to be better and, or, um, there was an and, or, I lost my train of thought. (laughs) Different. They'd have to be, yeah, different. Yeah. Yeah. Either more unique where I, I feel like, I don't, I can't, I don't have this style in my stable or just amazingly better in, in many different ways in the drawing and composition and storytelling and everything um, to where I'm like, I got to have this person. I don't Mm -hmm. see that in this work. I don't see, I got to have this person. It's good work. And I I don't want to take anything away, but, but like, especially right now where, you know, we've got like a recession looming and stuff. 
I think that what what you're saying, you know, what what an what an agent or an, uh, an artist rep has to say is, I can't afford not to take this person because there's money that I'm leaving on the table. There are deals out there that I'm missing out on by not having this person. What do you guys think? Is this a person that if you were a, an agent, you'd have to have? I think this person, you know, I think this person needs a good professional critique because I think their work is really good and mm -hmm. potentially sellable to an agent. I think they need some, some hard, a hard look from a pro at curating what's on the website. There's some illustrations that are much better than other ones. Of course, um, at some point you have to have somebody look at the work. Um, and I think this person would benefit greatly from it because there's a couple of covers, the house moving castle cover and the, and the other cover down at the bottom, um, start to be the best. Those two are by far the most sellable mm -hmm. images on the, the, the page. Mm -hmm. So I would almost lean towards if this person curated their work, they'd probably start to get work. But I agree with you. Well, like the, the combination now is pretty spotty. Um, and so they're probably getting the result because of that spottiness, you know, some of the illustrations just don't have the same flair that it looks like they're struggling a little bit with technique um, on some of them and just trying to find their total mm -hmm. style, finished style. But I think this person is six months away from an awesome portfolio. Mm -hmm. mm. Part of it for me too, is there's selections in here that while they're, they can be illustrative, you know, in my um, class on developing great visual stories, um, I, talk about you know there are illustrations that are professional that you'll find in children's books some of the best children's books some of the most commercially successful children's books that are boring right so not all not all illustrations can be and i i call them level one through level four not all can be level four level four is for me is is one that is visually interesting as far as technique and, and color and composition but also that tells a compelling story that just rips an emotion out of you. Mm -hmm. Some illustrations in books, in some of the most popular books, are just carry, you know, they're, they're, um, segue they're, images. What's that? Transition. Segway images. Yeah, yeah. segways, transitional mm -hmm. images that you have to have in the book to, to carry the story, but it's not something that you would want to put in your portfolio. I see images in this portfolio that to me feel like that, that where yeah. they're, they're just kind of like, you know, like I, I would, yeah, I would, I want to, I want to see more exciting illustrations that are telling more compelling stories in some of these. Yeah. Well, so like, I, cause I, I get this feeling too, a lot of times with my own work where I'm like, I am just not good enough. I see the level that I want to be at versus where I'm at right now. What would be like, what would be the game plan? Would it be, okay, let's just set aside, you know, a full day every week to creating a new portfolio piece and see what I, should I try for six new portfolio pieces in six months or should I try for one a week, you know, that are not as detailed and simpler? Like what would be, what would be the way to go about like building up that, that new portfolio style? I think the first that, step that polished, would be, the first step would be, back up, take a look at what's working and not lurking, working and come up with a good game plan. Mm -hmm. Why do some images look compelling and other images don't? I, think, I feel like some of them, her style looks a little like, for lack of a better term, like dirty. Like there's too much kind of marks on the page or something. Mm -hmm. um, other images don't have that. This one doesn't have that. But the one with the kids crawling through the, through the brush just kind of looks dirty. You know what I mean? I don't know what else it is. I don't know if it's sketch work underneath there. Um, but anyway, figure out what's working and 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 come up with a game plan first. And then mm -hmm. that's exactly what I do is like every two weeks, probably you have a portfolio piece that leaves you one full week of sketching and concepting and then one week to paint it. And that schedule mm -hmm. tends to work really well for most people working digitally. So mm -hmm. that means you could have up to 24 images in a year. That would be a new portfolio. And then you get rid of the worst, you know, five or six and then mm -hmm. you're you have a completely new portfolio, 15 to 18 pieces that are awesome. But you need to figure out where the direction you're going before you just start making work. Mm -hmm. Th cool. This one is the lead off image. And I'm, 
I, I like the color. I like the composition. Mm -hmm. I like the characters. I don't know what the story is, and it's not. Yeah, if they were just looking at something like a big, like a giant snowman coming over yeah. that hill. This is your most important <laughs> image because it's the one that's leading off. The lead and, off, yeah. You know, it's a great style. I mean, the ink work mm -hmm. looks great. The the I love the coloring. It's got this looseness to it. It's beautiful, mm -hmm. and the color balance is gorgeous. They're it's, to describe it to you guys. It's these two girls. They're in the snow, and it's kind of a wide format image, and they're looking off in the distance. And you know what's in the distance? Nothing. <laughs> And There's they look nothing. worried, but what are they worried about? They're really about? worried. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to, you see these like same themes coming up. Like it's the same critique that we had before. Mm -hmm. One thing too, I think just a general kind of comment to everybody here uh, that we've talked to and anybody listening is it, it, it's, you've got to broaden your inputs so many times, and I do this too, it's like you kind of follow these, you're, you're into the stuff you're into. So you've got 20 artists that you love, and that's the only artist you look at. You've got this particular genre of book that you like to read or genre of movie that you like to watch, and that's all you watch, and that's all you consume. And your job as a creative person is to collect as many different dots as possible to connect and if you're just so narrow with what you're consuming, then you're going to connect the same dots everybody else is connecting. So I would say, like, find 20 artists that that don't appeal to you initially. Find something to like in 20 different artists. Or go find 20 photographers to really get into. Or go find 20 sculptor, sculptors to really get into. Go watch you know, five movies from different decades. Say you're always watching movies from the last 20 years. Go watch five movies from the 1950s. See what that does for you. And pretty soon you're going to be like, you're going to have all these new inputs that you don't know what to do with. And you're going to all of a sudden think, oh man, that thing that I watched on that movie, plus these sculptures that I saw here, I just thought of a cool illustration to make that I don't think I've ever seen anybody do. So that's like, I think one of the key things missing from a lot of the stuff we've been seeing is just not, it's just, it, everything's so much the same of what we've, what we've, what we're used to. Right. Am I off? Am I off on that? No, I need that special spark. You know, I'm pulling up an image right now. Can you guys see this? My it's, screen. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the, one of the flight covers. Um, Chris Applehans did this particular image, I believe. Um, He's an amazing artist. He's one of my friends, and I'm just super jealous of how good he is. But you got this image of this sort of weird robot that's sitting on this in out in nature. They're, they're in like a forest, and there's this kid that has a bicycle, and he's like picking up some parts around the robot, and the robot looks mm -hmm. kind of dejected or sad or, uh, you know, so it's not going well for the robot. And it, and right. it just sets such a – like everything about it, is compelling and it's That's it's got so all the moody. things we were talking about it's moody the artwork itself just the art elements is really cool this big versus small relationship the color balance the lighting all that stuff is awesome and then it's got this story like i want to know what are these kids doing there are they helping this robot it's almost like an iron giant kind of scene that's being mm -hmm. built here but what are they doing are they helping him are they is is he in trouble is he going to make it what happened mm -hmm. before this and what happens after this and this is all from one image mm -hmm. it's amazing and mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff that is going to stick uh versus you know some of this like everyday stuff that's not telling any kind of interesting story i mean he's if this is a portfolio piece you can make anything you want to swing for the fences like mm -hmm. i'd rather right. pull somebody back and say that is too creative. <laughs> you went too far. <laughs> yeah. That rarely happens. So most of the time, if you notice what we're doing, we're saying push, push, push. Yeah. Just know this: if like um, agents are entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. They they're not hired by anybody. They they they're like us. They 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 self hired themselves, right? Yeah. So, so they, they, they want to make money. That's their motivation. They set up a mm -hmm. business, they buy an office or rent an office 
and they're looking for talent. They're looking for talent to make money off of. And if they're not, if you're mailing your, your work to them and they're not getting back to you, they're not asking to rep you, they, mm-hmm. that's their vote. Their vote is they don't think they can make money off of you, which means your work is lacking in, in one or more areas. And so that's, that would be the, the biggest answer is like, you know, you're trying to break in to the market over here, then you're going to have to change up your portfolio to start attracting. And it's, that's a hard thing because, you know, you just, mo- you know, the, one of the hardest things in this business is that people reject you and, you, and they never tell you why, you know. Right. <laughs> or, and, and they never, you know, and even if they do tell you why, sometimes they lie because <clears throat> it's easier to tell a lie than it is to tell the truth. Mm-hmm. And that that's that's hard because uh, you know we're all afraid to offend somebody. We're afraid to, you know, that telling the truth sometimes comes at a cost, and sometimes there's no incentive for an agent to actually tell you the truth or an editor to tell you the truth. So they come up with these weird terms yeah. like it's too commercial or it's not commercial enough. Or <laughs> and that actually segues into this a plug for um, what we're doing at SVS, and this is. If, if you're not on our email list, this is how we're getting the information out for this particular thing right now because it's sort of like a, a test, a pilot program. But what we've been doing are these portfolio reviews, in-depth, hour-long portfolio reviews with people. And what happens is you, uh, when you get the email, you, sign, you get the link to sign up for it. And there you fill out a form where you show you know, pieces that you're working, that you feel like uh, need work. You show a link to your website. You post links to artists that are influencing you or that you want to be influenced by. We take all, and then you fill out like, what do I want to work on? What am I trying to focus on? You, you fill out that, that form. So we know everything that we can do to help you help you. Then once we get that, uh, we go in and we do like an in-depth review. And I did one two weeks ago. I spent maybe four hours it was too long, <laughs> but I, I just got into it because I was like, oh, this guy really, really needs help. Going through, Lee made an amazing rubric. I went in and updated it for some things that I, I that that helped with, with my reviews as well. So we have this dialed in rubric where we go in point by point. We look at your website. We look at how it's presented. We look at your every piece in your portfolio and, and and what's lacking and what's there. We go point by point, like how's the compositions, how's the color, how are the character designs, all that stuff. So we give you feedback, all that, but then we record it in a video, a 30 minute video where we go through it, talk about everything, send that to you. And then there's and, an appointment. And give you the rubric too. And give you the rubric. And then there's uh, and then we have a, a one-on-one meeting with you. It's another half hour, a day or so later once you've reviewed that video and you have questions, then you can talk to a professional one-on-one and really get like uh, questions answered right then. And so they're not cheap. They're 350 bucks. But if you consider the people that I've talked to have said, this is the best money they've spent in regards to their education. Better than doing like a workshop for a weekend. You know, you sign up for these workshops, they're 300 or 500 bucks and they teach you how to watercolor. And that's great. And, you, and you've got like two really cool watercolor pieces that you finished, but this portfolio review can actually change the trajectory of your career. It's true. And so, if you don't get it with us, you got to get it with somebody. It's at a certain mm-hmm. point, you have to have somebody look at your work and be critical and be willing mm-hmm. to say, hey, this doesn't look like it's working based on what you said you wanted. I and mean, that's Just the big key. Is point that we you in the right to, direction. Right. Because some portfolio reviews you get, if you've had those quick ones at SEWI that are terrible, don't spend uh-huh. your money on them, by the way. Um, they're like five, 10 minutes. Somebody rifles through your work. Oh, that's pretty good. Get this one, this one. I like this one. Okay. Good luck. Yeah, <laughs> never do this thing nothing. again and boom. <laughs> Let me but, make an amendment on there because I've done those portfolios at SEWI. That's why I'm not. saying they're bad. <laughs> 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 it depends on who you get. Sometimes they can be good, but often. Well, the problem is they I schedule have, them in ten-minute increments, though. Right. So I've I, I I've actually, you know, it, it's like anything. It's like there are times where I have cringed at who I know different art schools are hiring because I have the p- piece of paper and I'm like those poor students. Yeah. Or I've had students come to me and say, um, "Can you help me?" 
Can you give me a review? Sure. What, what's going on? Where'd you go to school? I went to school here and I studied under so-and-so. And then they look at you like, please help me. I, you know, like, <laughs> like, look at what I've been subjected to. And I know the person and I'm like, yeah, that's a, that's another person who is gainfully employed because of their paper, not because of their portfolio. And mm-hmm. it's really sad. Yeah. Um, and, but then again, the flip side is true. And I know plenty of really good teachers There's at art schools. So it's, but the problem is as a student, you go in and you don't know who you're going to get. So with us, right. you know who you're going to get. And that's, and you get to, you of, get to pick. It's not just yeah. us three. There's like, we have, I don't know, like 12 different teachers, all professionals that are working um, Vesper Stamper. I mean, some great David Hone has had some great critiques. I mean, they're it's always really cool to see that stuff. I'd like to segue that into one little confessional. You that, say that I got to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Go ahead. Wow. I just wanted to um, to say, you know, it sounds like we know what we're doing. And when we're looking at your work, we do know what we're doing. Um, but I don't want to give the impression that this career has like uh, you know, a set of check marks that if you just check all the boxes, then you got it. And then it's easy. Mm-hmm. Um, I have submitted a new dummy with my agent to a handful of publishers. I think we started with a list of maybe 15 and I don't want to give the illusion that all of a sudden we got this all figured out and it's easy. Um, I'm getting rejection letters just like everybody gets rejection letters. It's not, it's not just like, okay, I know all the steps and then boom, I I can do whatever I want. I can publish a book or whatever. Uh, And it's frustrating too, because some of the feedback I get from editors will be contrary to each other. I got Mm -hmm. one person saying that my work is too commercial. If anybody has ever seen my work, that's not a a critique I get too often. Uh, Another one said that it's not commercial enough. It's too dark and sophisticated. So it's it's sort of a crapshoot, but I just don't want to sell the fact that we. It's not uh, cause and effect. Yeah, that it's that it's easy all of a sudden when you get all the ingredients going. I right. think I've got the ingredients to make a good children's book, and I like the book that I submitted. But mm-hmm. I do want to be honest and transparent about the process. It's a it's a it's a tough career, and it's hard, and there's a lot of second guessing. The only time it there's no second guessing is when you're telling a story in hindsight. Mm-hmm. But like Will's doing this book series right now, I'm sure every day he wakes up, should I make, should I print 2,000 of these books or 5,000? Right. Should I sell here or should yep. I sell there? Should I, should I make five new uh, series or, or, or follow it with something new? Every day is these decisions that there's no precedent for it. There's no roadmap for it. And I just want to be really transparent. It's just fun to go through the process of submitting something new just like you guys are doing if you're making dummies and making work and you're just crossing your fingers. Like, I hope I did all the things that, that, you know, somebody's going to say yes to, but you don't know. So I'll, I'll keep you guys updated as it goes. I've, I've gotten, I think five rejections out of the, out of the 15 and I've got six publishers considering it. And so, you know, we'll see, we'll see where it goes. You know, another thing along with that is sometimes I've had students to get published and I look at, their story and I look at their book and I'm like, Hmm, I would have thought that would have got rejected, you know? So (laughs) it's, it it works both ways. Um, but the most important thing I think you said was it's not cause and effect. It's not, it's, you know, that's, that's the teaching job. That's what most jobs are. It's like you have the, you check all the boxes, you get hired. That's not the, not the case when you're, we are inventors, right? Mm -hmm. Making a children's story or a comic or a, a game or something like that is you are an inventor. You're inventing things. Not all yeah. inventions are good or the, or commercially the public doesn't value all inventions the same. Sometimes you have one that it's like band, like musicians and bands would often say, you know, it was the B side that, that made the top 40 and we right. didn't even like that thing. You know, we just threw it on there as a filler the, this was the supposed to be the hit right here, the front side, you know. So. Right. <laughs> cool. Well, should we take it out? Let's wrap it up. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. Uh, your hosts have been Will Terry, Lee White, and Jake Parker. Special thanks to our podcast producer, Daniel Tu. You can find his work at daniel2.co. Uh, two is spelled T-U. 
Uh, special thanks to our show notes wrangler, Lily Howell, our chief operations officer, Lisa Fott. And now, go draw something. The coughing problem. I got an update uh-huh. for the people that I've blown out their eardrums. Oh, yeah. This coughing. is good. to. <laughs> <laughs> so we record in Zoom, and we also record on our own computers the, the actual master um, audio file. Mm-hmm. And I had been pa- I had been hitting mute on the Zoom file when I need to sneeze or cough so I wouldn't interrupt the conversation with Jake and Lee. So Jake and Lee wouldn't hear it. And then I was assuming that our video editor, Daniel, would see it on my sound, on my master sound audacity file Mm -hmm. and clip it out. But what he was relying on is listening to the Zoom file to Mm -hmm. see all the pops and the, the, you know, the, things that drop in the background or whatever, and then he'll yeah. go to those master files and knock it out. So I was actually inadvertently working against our guy by muting those so he couldn't see him and thought everything was fine. So now I'm going to go ahead and cough on Zoom and he'll be able to cut him out of the master file. So Do a cough for us. Let's see. Yeah, see, you guys couldn't hear that. Yeah, see, you couldn't even hear it because Daniel cut it out. Yeah. He better cut this one out. <laughs> Everybody's very interested in that story. All right. <laughs> that was an interesting story, Lee. That was compelling. That was, a, that was an absolute... It awesome. made you laugh. <laughs> Would you guys honestly think of my uh, dad joke, my San Diego? I like it. Well, if you if you grew up with let go my ego commercials, mm-hmm. then you would That's get dated. it. Dated. But like I'm thinking, like I said, I said let go my San Diego, and I bet like it went over a lot of people's heads because <laughs> the young people if they hadn't heard let go my ego. I told it to my kids. They they still sell ego waffles at the store, and, but and they we, don't have we'll get them from anymore. time to time. What? Well. Yeah, the ego is still a thing. Lego my ego isn't a thing. But I didn't say Lego my ego. I said San Diego. But that's I can't believe we're analyzing my stupid my dad joke. <laughs> you, have to. you should have said Lego my San Diego. Yeah, what 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 do you call it when the beach grabs your waffle? <laughs> <laughs> that's a dumb joke. The setup, the setup is so That's so bizarre. stupid. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I like about Let go my San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> when the oh, gets yeah. worse from Let's here. go of your waffle. I love I love how hard you got to work to get there to the punchline. Right. I could tell you thought of the punchline first and then you had to kind of backtrack to figure out how to get there. <laughs> right, right. That's all that's all my jokes are. 